Welcome to another episode at the Fitness Oracle. Today we're sitting down with Kevin Palmieri from Next Level University. Early in his life, Kevin found success, but after a brush with suicide, he realized he wasn't living a life he truly wanted. He became passionate about self-improvement and decided to make it his purpose in life to impact as many people as possible, becoming a role model podcaster and speaker. In this episode, we go deep into some really amazing topics that surround commitment, consistency, habits, limiting beliefs, and personal failures. Now, I know you guys are going to get a lot of really great information out of this. So as always, always remember when you're watching these long form episodes, have a pen and paper with you, grab a cup of joe, and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Fitness Oracle, where we have real conversations with real people just like you, with real stories just like yours. And this is one of their stories. I am your host, John Katsavos. My guest today is Kevin Palmieri of, from Next Level University. Kevin is the founder and co-host of Next Level University podcast. Early in his life, Kevin found success, but after a brush with suicide, he realized he wasn't living a life he truly wanted. He became passionate about self-improvement and decided to make his, it his purpose in life to impact as many people as possible by becoming a role model podcaster and speaker. He has succeeded to make his podcast one of the top 100 with over 950 episodes, currently over 1,000 episodes. Mm -hmm. And is listened to listened in over 120 countries. He has taken his life to the next level and achieved both personal and professional success. Kevin, welcome to the show. John, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for in real time changing the 950 to 1000. It, it happens very quick. And I'm sure we sent this bio over a little while ago. So I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Uh, I'm excited to chat today, my friend. Um, it's amazing to have you on here. Um, I was going through some of the questions and I was going through some of your, um, uh, uh, some of your, uh, uh, Instagram, I can't, Instagram posts. And I can't wait to dig into some of the stuff that I, that, that I came up with, but first and foremost, a huge, huge congratulations for hitting the 1000 episode mark. I personally know how hard it is to get to the 250 mark. <laughs> <laughs> so big shout out, big congrats, big props. Uh, that's a massive milestone. Congratulations, my Thank friend. You. I appreciate it very much. I think uh, one of the things, and I don't know if we'll touch on this or not, but I was thinking of this today. Oftentimes I have my best thoughts in the shower. I think that's just a thing that happens. Uh, I was thinking that a lot of people see the thousand and they think, oh man, if I could get to a thousand episodes, that would be amazing. When in reality, we're trying to have the most successful podcast in the self-improvement industry ever. So it's just, we have to hit a thousand episodes. So it's this weird thing about the size of the goal you set, I think determines what you celebrate along the way. So really check in with that when you come, when it comes to goal setting. For me, it was just, for me personally, when I first started podcasting, I was like, let's see what happens when I get to a hundred. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Now it's like, let's see what happens when I get to 250. So it's, uh, I, I, what about you? What about your journey to the 1000 episode mark? What was that like? It's, uh, I don't know. It's this weird thing where I was trying to think of how to explain this. And I feel like it's a very deep thought process, but it's also very simple. But I think of it as very much what I just said. If we're trying to climb Mount Everest, in theory, we've only made it to kind of the first summit, like the first level, the first base camp. And I think it actually went by pretty fast, all things considered. And I would say this is probably the most difficult thousand we'll ever do because the first you got to think the first 500, I was broke, 
you know, I was a broke entrepreneur. We were trying to figure this out. We didn't have a team very much what you were saying in the beginning. I was doing all of this myself with Alan. Um, but what I will say is I have learned so much about business. I've learned so much about uh, self-awareness. I've learned so much about economics, about success. The thing I've learned the most about is me for sure. And I'm sure you would mirror that in some way, shape or form. So yeah, I have learned a ton. There have been a ton of trials and tribulations, but the thing that I've learned the most about is me. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And one of the things I always say to people, particularly people who aren't podcasters is I have the unique benefit that I can look back and I can say, okay, on April 15th, of 2020, this is how I felt. And I can watch one of our episodes. If you don't have that opportunity, take out your phone, record a video of how you feel right now in your life, and then look at that in a month, two months, six months, a year and see what changed. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. You said that because, uh, when I first got into podcasting and online, online entrepreneurship, um, I was brought into this whole concept of this world with uh, a 10 vlog challenge, 10 day vlog challenge. And you had mm -hmm. to vlog for 10 days straight. And it was quite interesting looking back two years ago, what was uh, going through my mind. So for me, it was a quite interesting journey from, uh, from when I first started, you know, all this stuff. And it's been two years for me. How long did it take you to get to 1000? Uh, five years and two months. So what's that? 62 months. Yeah. In the beginning, it was very similar to where everybody else starts. I mean, we started doing one episode a week when I first started by myself. I think I did 20 episodes before I partnered with Alan. And in that the first 20 episodes, I was all over the place. I mean, I was missing episodes. I would post one every couple of weeks whenever I had time because I was working a full time job. And for me, it was very much a passion project. And then from the day Alan and I partnered up, we never missed an episode when we were supposed to record. So it went from one a week to two a week to three a week. And then I think we jumped to five. And then I think we might have gone from five to seven because it was like, look, if we're going to do six, we might as well do seven. What's what's one more day? Um, but yeah, five years, five years and two months is, is what it took us to get to a thousand. That's awesome. Um, it also puts things into perspective for a lot of people, um, especially like people like me and people uh, behind me that are just starting podcasting and everything and are about thinking about podcasting. Everybody sees the the 1000k mark, the, the 1k mark and uh, this successful online business and people have this tendency of thinking it's going to happen overnight. Yeah. And it brings um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today to the forefront for these people. But before we get into that, I want to know, like I always, I asked this, I've just started asking this about all my guests, what got you into this line of work? It's a, it's a great question. I was in my mid twenties and I had achieved what you would, most people would consider success. I had a six figure job. I had the body of my dreams. I had just done a bodybuilding show and, and won my division um, my girlfriend was a model. I had a sports car. I had a new apartment by all outside standards. I was quite literally living the dream, but I really wasn't. I was super insecure. I was living with a low level of self-belief, self-worth. And one day my girlfriend came to me and said, Hey, I want to move across the country from New Hampshire to California and chase my dreams. And I gave her every reason in the book why she shouldn't do it. I was scarce. I was afraid. I didn't want to be left behind. I I just didn't want to do that. And she ended up coming to me a couple of weeks later and saying, Hey, Kev, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to break up with you and I'm going to go chase my dreams. This is what I have to do. And I'm very proud of her. I'm glad she did that. That was the right move. But when she did that, John, I had to look in the mirror and realize I didn't really like who I was. I wasn't proud of the man that I was. I was a shell of who I thought I really was. And I, that's what got me into self-improvement originally. I would go to bed and I'm, you know, I have a two bedroom apartment by myself, going to bed by myself. It's lonely. It's it's just that empty energy, just like, oh my God, I don't, I don't like this. This is just, it's so lonely here. But I would say these positive affirmations every night before I went to bed. I would say, I'm talented, I'm handsome, I'm worthy, I'm intelligent. And this year I'm gonna make the most money I've ever made in my entire life because I thought the money would fix the void I was I was feeling inside of me. And the beginning of that next year, I ended up getting a promotion 
and I was working in the weatherization industry. So it was our job to go into schools, into fire stations, police stations, anything a state or government owned and make the buildings more energy efficient. So that was my job. When I got promoted to foreman, that meant I was opening the job and closing the job. So I was on every job for the entire time. And we did a lot of our work out of state. So if you look at that year, I spent 10 months out of that 12 months on the road. Every single week I was living in hotels. I was working out in different gyms, trying to find groceries, eating fast food, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the grind because I was making a lot of money. I remember I opened my last pay stub and I made hundred thousand dollars at 26 with no college degree. But I had another one of those moments where I had to look at myself and say, well, I'm still insecure. I still have no self-esteem. I'm not confident. And this money is not fixing the internal problems. In that moment, I realized that for most of my life, I had been living unconsciously. The opposite of unconscious was hyperconscious. So I did what anybody does. I started a podcast shortly thereafter called the Hyperconscious Podcast. And that is what has evolved into where we are today. And I just was having conversations with real people about real things. One of my first episodes, I think it was my second one. I sat down with a good friend of mine who debated committing suicide. He called me up one day when we were in middle uh, high school and he said, Hey, I'm having these suicidal thoughts. Will you come to the hospital with me? And I said, yeah, man, I'm there. And I ended up going to the hospital with him. And, you know, I waited in the waiting room. We went into the the room with him and we talked to the doctor and all that stuff. And him and I just talked about that live on the podcast, what, what that was like, what that experience was like. And that's how my podcasting journey started. It, it started with me wanting to go, what we would say, hyper-conscious, like, let's go hyper-conscious. Let's talk about everything involving awareness. And that was the very beginning for me. And that is when I fell in love with podcasting. That's awesome. Uh, that's a really, that's really good. Like, um, Mine was a little bit different, but uh, everybody's journey is different, right? I mean, if everybody's journey was the same, it, this life would be really freaking right. boring. Yes. And different is not bad. Different. Yeah. Different is good. Different is important. You've had your bouts with, uh, uh, with suicide too. What, yeah. was, what, what was the trigger for you? Like, what was the turning point for you where you said, okay, you know what? This is not healthy for me and I need to do something different. Yeah. So what happened was shortly after I started the podcast, it's almost like I stopped caring about the job and the money. I found quote unquote success and it wasn't success. And I was like, this isn't it. I, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And then I started the podcast and the podcast became my passion. And I just stopped caring about my job. I, it was so hard for me to pack up just as like for context, I would pack up my suitcase every Sunday with the same clothes that I wore the last week. So I would just do laundry, take my dirty clothes out of the suitcase, throw them in the laundry, take them from the laundry and throw them back into my suitcase and then leave Sunday work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the road, come home and then rinse and repeat. That's basically how I was living. I was living out of a suitcase. So when I had the podcast, I remember I just wanted to be home more. I just said like, I can't do this on the road anymore. Like I really have this thing that I feel like I could be good at. I feel like I'm actually making a change in the world because I'm having real conversations with real people. So what happened was I started calling out of work. Like I'd be like, yeah, I can't come in or I can't, I can't travel this week. Something came up. I'd leave the job site early. I'd show up late sometimes. And it got to the point where I would have to be in New Jersey, which was a six hour ride from where I lived Monday at 7 a.m. I'd have to be on site Monday at 7 a.m. I would go to bed in Massachusetts, where I was living at the time, at 9 p.m. Sunday, I would sleep in my bed till like midnight. I'd get up and I'd drive straight to the job site six hours. I'd work an eight-hour day and then I'd go to the gym. And then on Fridays, I kind of did the opposite. But what really happened was it just kept pulling me further and further out of alignment. And it's almost like I saw a way out, but I didn't have the courage to take it. The way out in this is podcasting, not the suicide part. So I woke up one day in New Jersey, it was probably like 5.15 in the morning in a crusty hotel room, nothing against New Jersey. And I slid to the edge of the bed and I was lacing up my work boots. And the best way to explain it is there was 10 televisions on in my head and every single one was on a different station. And one was saying, you're stuck here forever. You're never going to make this kind of money again. 
You make $100 an hour sometimes, and you're not going to make that again. Uh, if you do leave, what will your friends think? What will your family think? And do you really think you can be a successful podcaster? Do you think you're going to quit this and then like start a, a successful business? It's not going to happen. The, the loudest voice for me said that. It said, there's no way you can be a successful podcaster. And in that moment, I just felt so trapped. I felt so stuck. I felt so helpless, so hopeless that I felt like if I was to take my life, I would take my problems with me. That's really what happened. It was very much a slow burn of me going more and more out of alignment and feeling less and less hopeful for the future. I ended up texting my business partner, Alan, and saying, hey, I don't, I don't know why I'm feeling this, but I'm having a lot of, a lot of dark thoughts. And he said, well, you're, you have changed so much over the last couple of years, but your environments, they haven't really changed that much. I think it's time for you to change your environment. And then I ended up leaving my job three or four months later and becoming a broke entrepreneur for the next three years. And, and again, I'm very grateful for all that. And I can talk comfortably about it now because it's more of a scar than a, an open wound. But yeah, that's, that's really what happened. I found success. I realized it wasn't success. And then I think it just really triggered and broke loose a lot of things. Your story is very familiar mm. to me. Mm. And I'm sure there's people out there listening where that story is, is familiar because they are living that life right now. And yeah. I had that epiphany when I came back from Greece last summer. And every day feel, felt like Groundhog Day. I took some time off, reevaluated everything, came, moved down to Florida. And I put my stake, stake in the ground like we talked before. I put, I put my stake in the ground and said, I'm doing this. I'm doing this full-time. This is my full-time gig. So um, has there any been, has there been any times where you wanted to say, you know what, enough is enough of this. I'm going to go back to what I was doing because I was making good money and enough is enough. Yeah, it's gotten pretty bad, but... I remember I told my grandmother, Mima, we call her Mima. When I left my job, I went over there and I said, hey, I quit my job and I'm going to do this podcast thing full time. And I remember she said, Kev, you got to get a job. You're not like, what are you going to do? And I said, I will never punch a time card for somebody else. I will die before I do that. I, I cannot, I can't do it. I was not meant to do that. I was meant to do this. So yeah, there have been some, there have been some very, very difficult times like my car broke down a few years ago and I had like a hole in one of the pistons in my engine and it would just stall at red lights and it would just turn off. But I just kept driving it because I needed to get to the studio. Um, my brakes went and I couldn't get those fixed because I didn't have the money. My fiance had to pay rent several times. I couldn't afford Christmas presents for her two years in a row. It was brutal. Like this, this journey has taken parts of me that I will never get back, but it has also taken any entitlement I had, there's very little of that left. You know, this is, this has been a very humbling journey. So no, things have gotten really, really, really difficult, but I never, I've been offered other jobs. I never even thought about it. I don't think I would be happy. I wouldn't be fulfilled. I'd regret it. I'd regret it. And I also believe that that's what taught me how to succeed being broke is one of the best things that's ever happened because now I know with the money that we have, I'm going to be fine because I've adopted those behaviors and I've learned those habits. So in, for me, at least being broke and, and struggling that bad has made me really appreciate everything I do have now. I'm assuming that your fiance right now is your wife. Uh, not yet. Not well, yet. she's, she's about, she's about to be, but she's about to yeah, be. Okay. we're going to Colorado to elope. Awesome. Awesome. How important was her support during those hard times for you? Mm. The most, the, the most important. It's, it's interesting because we knew each other before the podcast. So her and I dated, I don't know how many years ago, but we dated before I was hyper-conscious Kevin. I was a bodybuilder who did not care about self-improvement. I didn't care about personal development. I just wanted to work out and hang out. That was all, and nothing against that, right? But that, that's who I was at, the point, at that time, and she was into self-improvement. So we ended up um, separating, breaking up. We all, both went about our lives, and I remember I told my friends this. I said, I need to find somebody who understands me. 
Like I'm, I'm struggling to find somebody who gets me. I don't feel like a lot of people get me. And I said, you know who got me? Taryn. Taryn got me. I don't know how to explain it, but she understood me. She knows me. I don't know how to explain it. I need somebody like Taryn. And then I ended up like refinding her on Facebook. She had been newly single. So I sent her a message and then we reconnected and went out and got uh, coffee or, or tea or whatever it was the first time. But I think there's a couple things. One, the support is amazing because somebody that believes in you and is really willing to be on the journey with you. It's not like she's watching from a distance. Like she's very, very attached to the journey to the point where she was paying the bills to the point where she's taking my last name. That's very, I mean, you don't get much more attached than that. But I think the other part of it, John, is the extra Y power. You know, I tell her all the time, like I, I will not fail. I will do whatever it takes to succeed because I appreciate all of the time and the energy and the uncertainty that she's put up with. And candidly, I mean, she's still making sacrifices. I know I work seven days a week. I don't work a lot Sunday. I, I work, you know, pretty much a full day Saturday. Sunday's our day, but I work late. I work till six, seven some nights, and we only get a couple hours together every night. And that's something I'm trying to transition away from. But it's it's hard when you're trying to build a business to to have all the buckets being filled at the same time. So even to this day, she's still making sacrifices and and being very, very supportive of my goal. She, we joked about something yesterday. I said, uh, yeah, my last call on Friday doesn't end till five 30 or Saturday. Sorry. My last call on Saturday doesn't end till five 30. And she says, I hate it. I hate that. And I said, do you like, are you serious? Cause if so, I want to have a conversation. She said, no, I understand. I understand. It's just sad sometimes that, you know, we can't really do anything on the weekends. And it's like, yeah, I know it sucks. And it's not always the best in the world, but I, I promise you it will be worth it. I promise you all of our dreams will come true and we'll be inspiring and impacting many, many people along the way. It's, um, it's refreshing. It's refreshing to hear that, especially, you know, from someone who didn't have that support from his better half. Mm. So it's refreshing to hear that you, someone out there has it. So I'm, I'm to the moon ecstatic for you Thank to you. the moon. Thank you. Um, we're going to be talking about failures in a little bit later on in the show, but I wanted to switch gears a little bit and start talking about commitment mm. because commitment is a big issue, especially when it comes to guys. It's, it's this scary, scary word or so we think it is. Why do you think that we have it? Why, why do you think that we think that it's so scary? I think it's, there's a lot of different reasons. Are we talking about specifically in relationships or just in general? Just in general, because uh, if you if you look at the big picture, I mean, any form of commitment has to do with any form with all forms of relationships, whether yeah. it be to your business or to your partner or to your family. So it's it's um, it in general, I would say one of the reasons is and you can I mean, you can think back to like high school when you're not committed and you fail, it doesn't hurt as bad. It's one of those things of if you say, I'm going to accomplish, I am committed and I'm going to accomplish blank by blank date, put it in writing, it will happen. If it doesn't happen, number one, it hurts. Number two, if you have people in your life who aren't supportive, they're going to crap on you and say, well, I thought you were going to be a millionaire by the time you were 40. What are you doing? Right? That. And I think it forces you to take things more seriously. I really do. I think it's one of those things of, when you're fully committed, it actually creates the necessity that you need to accomplish something, but it also puts a, a fair amount of pressure on your shoulders. So you'll like this, John, Alan and I, we had a conversation on the podcast recently and we were like, you know what? We're kind of out of shape. We're, I'm not living up to my standards when it comes to fitness. Alan wasn't living up to his. So this is what we're going to do. This is how committed we are, but there's a lot of pressure. Alan and I, said on the podcast that we will both lose 10 pounds by August 1st. If I do not achieve my goals, I do not get to record my episode on August 1st. If Alan does not achieve his goals, he does not get to record the episode on August 1st. If we both miss, there will be no episode. There is very few things that are more committed or require more commitment than saying, look, we're going to stop the streak that we've never missed if we do not make our weight loss goals. I think the amount of pressure that comes with that is great, but it also is a lot for people. You know, it's, it's a lot for people. I'm down 
I think five and a half pounds. So I'm right on schedule for where I should be great. But I've also had to say no to many things that I didn't want to. I'm also hungry constantly. You know, I'm hungry every single day and I'm not uh, saving energy by going on all the podcasts I do. So yeah, I think when you're committed to something, it kind of gets rid of all of the easy outs. And when there's no easy outs, you have to take it more seriously. And then the last part of this is it's easy to just say you want a goal. It's very easy to say, well, I want to lose X amount, or I want to make X amount, or I want to do this, or I want to go here. It's easy to say that. But when you're committed, that's another level. And that takes another level of dedication that not everybody is necessarily willing to put in. Do you think that the, that do you think that there's some people out there that will um, that will commit to the goal, but you know, two three weeks into it, they'll be like, eh, you know, yeah. I'll have the extra chocolate bar. Yeah, I'll have the extra ice cream. I'll take today off. Yeah, especially what I think is, I think goal setting is pretty pretty simple, all things considered. I really do. I don't think goal strategizing is simple. So most people don't have the awareness of what it'll actually take. So when they set the goal to your point, it's a goal, not an intention. If you have a goal to do a thousand episodes, that's a goal. Cool. If you intend on doing a thousand episodes, that's different. That's a completely different thing. So I think it's a balance of number one, being willing to do whatever it takes. Number two, trying to figure out what it's going to take. I think it's lack of awareness. I had no idea how hard it was going to be to get to a thousand. My awareness wasn't there. Now that I know, I know we can do 5,000. It's just a matter of enough time. So I think that's part of it. Yeah. Because, okay, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. I told you I did one bodybuilding show. My buddy was doing a bodybuilding show and he said, Hey, you should do this with me. This was after I had already done my show. Uh, I had done a bulk and I was like, I don't really want to do it. I just did it last year. I don't know if I want to do this again. My coach said, Hey, you really crushed it last year. You should really do another show. You know, since we've been working together longer, you'll get better results because we're more dialed in. And I was like, ah, I don't know if I really want to do this, but I started doing it. So I started my diet and I was a month in a month and a half in. And I remember for one of my cheat meals, I got uh, half a pint of Ben and Jerry's, which was amazing. It was the best, but I had half a pint left in my freezer. And I couldn't sleep one night and I was miserable and I was starving. And I said, you know what? Screw this. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing the rest of this. I went downstairs, ate the other half a pint of ice cream, texted my buddy, texted my coach and said, hey, I'm not doing this. I was aware of what it would take. I knew exactly what it was going to take for me to get that next month and a half down. And I just wasn't willing to do it. So some people, maybe they realize, you know what? This isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I want. Maybe this is detrimental more than it's productive towards my goal. So yeah, I think it's, it can be a mix of things. What, what do you do? Like, like, what do you, is there anything that you do specifically that helps you stay committed to, to a task? Mostly public accountability. Um, as much as I'd like to say, I'm just a really, really consistent human being. I do 20 things a day, like 20 habits a day, but our entire team can see it. So we have like a, a dashboard where I can look and say, oh, John did blank, 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 blank. Mm, John's missing on this. The entire team can see everything I do every single day. Most of the team has access to my calendar. They can see exactly what I'm doing. So I think it's the, it's the public accountability. I don't want to look bad. You know, I, I, want to, I want to be a good leader. So I think that's one of the things. And the second part of it is, and this does not work for everybody. I realize that. I just have a, I have a, a commitment and a conversation with myself of either you do blank, blank, and blank, and blank, or you do not get the goals that you want. It's up to you. Either you show up and do what you're supposed to do, or you don't get the goals that you want. And that's very much how I live my life because I have a high enough awareness to know, like, if you don't do this, you're not going to get the result. If I don't eat under what I need, I'm not going to lose weight. It just, it's not going to work that way. So I have to do that. That's what I signed up for. So those are two big parts. And then I think the third one is this journey isn't about me. It's about, it's the mission. It's the mission. We don't do seven episodes a week because I, I want to necessarily. It's because we want to be in the pocket of our community every single day. If you can get a little bit better every single day, that's what we preach 
right? If you can get a little better every day, your life can look completely different in a few years. Well, we better be in your pocket every single day if that's what we're saying. So I think that's the third part is it's the mission. I, I, I feel a responsibility to show up for our community because they, they're amazing and they support us and, you know, they rely on us sometimes to, to help them get to the next level. Wow. That's, um, that's so true though. It's so mm -hmm. true. It's, um, you know, you, you said something there that's really important. Something that hit home to me, um, something that I came into more awareness back two years ago, just before, just, just after the pandemic hit was, uh, accountability, personal accountability and making it public. Mm. Uh, I signed, I had signed up to Brian Rose's London Reels business, business accelerator program. And the whole thing is about accountability within the group. And they had, and he has like a support system to help, you know, you stay on your, on your path. How important have you seen it and in, in your life and do you implement it for people inside your community? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, making it public. I watched a video recently on YouTube and the video, what the title of it was why you shouldn't tell people your goals. And I was like, oh, interesting. Let me check this out. Let me see what this is about. Maybe we'll do an episode on this. And the reason behind it, the through line of the entire YouTube video was number one, the people in your life are going to make fun of you. Okay. Interesting. The people in your life are uh, in your life are going to crap on you when you don't accomplish your goals. Somebody might steal your ideas. People are going to be putting pressure on you to accomplish your goals. And I remember having this breakthrough of every single one of those through lines suggests that you kind of have negative people in your life, right? If somebody would steal your idea, they're probably not a good friend. If they're going to crap on you for not accomplishing your goals, they're not super supportive and they probably don't have a growth mindset. So we try to leverage it in a positive way where for like group coaching, for instance, you're in a WhatsApp group with everybody else from the group. And we do public reports of, okay, this person did 90% of their habits. This person did 80%. This person is the highest in the group. So yeah, we really try to use public accountability throughout our entire business, whether it's our team tracking their habits, everybody can see everybody's stuff. Everybody can see everybody's stuff. And then at an even deeper level, I try to be very transparent with all of our numbers. Like if you said, how many listens do you have? I would, I'll tell you the exact amount. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hide from that. So I think even saying that it, it makes sure that I'm telling the truth, but yeah, we use it everywhere in our community, everywhere in our community. And it's, you got to balance it with safety though. People have to feel safe. I want you to feel a little bit of pressure. I don't want you to feel shame, right? Cause that's a fine line. There's, there's a fine line between pressure and you feeling terrible about yourself because you don't have a good score or you're not in first place or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm a true believer that the worst position anybody could be is in the number one spot, because for me, the number one spot, there's no push for me. So it's <laughs> number two spots, the best spot for me, because it mm. keeps pushing me to get, um, to be, to become better. Yeah. Um, kind of backtracking a little bit. You said something that actually kind of, uh, again, hit home with me. Everything that you say is, keeps hitting home with me and I love it. I mean, it's great. Um, people with negative mindsets, how do you deal with somebody who is close into your personal circle, family member, cousin, sister, brother, parent, partner? How do you deal with them? Because you can't get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a challenge. I think there's a couple ways. So I always, I never say get rid of, I do say reallocate time. So that's one thing. And, and we'll, we can go into that. But what we say is it's called the vulnerable problem solver. So it's something along the lines of a conversation where you go in and you be vulnerable about your thoughts, about your feelings, about your fears. And you say, this is what I believe would solve the problem. So it could be something along the lines of, John, I understand that you don't know why I'm podcasting. And I know you think it's a giant waste of time. And you know, I know you think I'm probably going to never make any money, but 
you have to understand that this fills me up. I'm fulfilled by this. I'm actually helping people and I get messages all the time. And honestly, I'd rather be somewhat successful at this than wildly successful at anything else. My fear is that you're going to keep not believing in me and that's going to cause us to drift apart a little bit. I've always supported everything you do. I'd really appreciate if you could support me a little bit better. And this is how I receive support. That's a wonderful conversation to have. Again, will it go that smoothly? Most likely not. But I think you have to open up the conversation. There's really, there's two ways. There's two ways. Either you express your truth to the best of your abilities, or you depress your truth and you leave the relationship. There really are those two options. The problem is it's very hard to change people. It's very, very difficult to change people. So what I have done is reallocated time. That is what I've done. That's, I have a weird relationship with relationships. So I'm pretty good at that. And I have a very small circle and I like it that way. I don't require a lot of attention or energy from other people. So, but I think that you have to have that vulnerable conversation, but that's a challenge. That's a challenge. And this is the question that I have people ask Are the people in your life the best from your past or the best for your future? Are the people in your life, particularly your friends, are they your friends because they've always been your friends? You went to high school together. You went to college together. You used to party. You used to do this. You used to do this. Or are they in your life because they are helping you get to the goals that you have set for the future? I have a client and a good friend who has distanced herself from her family heavily because her family is toxic. And she does get lonely and she does get sad, but she wants to accomplish her goals and her family holds her back on purpose. And she had to have that hard conversation with herself and figure out, you know, will I regret distancing myself from my family? That's a question you have to ask. Will I regret not distancing myself from my family? That's a question you have to ask. So it's very personal, but I think either you have to express your vulnerable truth or you have to reallocate time. And ideally you try the first, you try to express your truth first and then reallocate time ideally. But I understand that you know, for some people, cutting people out is easier than telling the truth. Yeah, it really is sometimes. Yeah. Um, and um, it kind of leads into the next point that I want to talk about, which is, uh, you know, discussing people's comfort zones and living out, outside, just, just outside that comfort zone where you feel comfortable. I know I saw it on one of your, uh, on your, one of your Instagram uh, posts that, you know, you know, getting us, getting outside of your comfort zone. Um, for me, I found personally how much you actually grow. And when you stay in the comfort zone, how much you actually contract, mm. what have you seen? What do you, what have you seen? How do you help people, um, understand that? Yeah. I had a, I had a call with somebody recently and we were talking about this. So the, there's the comfort zone, there's the learning zone, and then there's the anxiety zone. The comfort zone is where you can operate walking in your sleep. Like it's just sleepwalking through it. It's easy. It's, it's just intuitive. It's very simple. The learning zone is where you're challenged. You're challenged there. You can definitely make a mistake and you can you know, have quote unquote failures. The anxiety zone is where it's almost like you're going underwater and you cannot stay there for very long. You can only hold your breath for so long. So I had somebody come to me and she said, I want to be a speaker like you, maybe have a podcast in the future. And I said, awesome. Love that. Okay, cool. On a scale of one to 10, zero being comfort. So let's we'll just say on a scale of zero to 10, zero being like the most comfortable you can be, 10 being the most anxious you can be, five being like right in the middle of the learning zone. Where is you giving a speech on stage in front of a thousand people? And she said, that's like a 15 out of 10. I said, okay, that's a lot. Okay. On a scale of zero to 10, how do you feel about recording a video and just not showing anybody? And she said, oh, that's like a zero. I said, okay. On a scale of zero to 10, where does it land if I say you're going to send me a video about you talking about something you're passionate about and nobody else in the world is going to see it? And she said, that's probably like a five or a six. I said, cool, do that. And here's why. Number one, it's scary, but it's not scary enough to stop you from doing it. And I think more importantly, number two, if it goes badly, there's not a ton of pain associated. 
Worst case scenario, I send her a message and say, ah, eh, it's the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I would never do that because that's not a way to build somebody up, but you never know, somebody else might. So what I have seen is it's very much the chicken or the egg. People think, well, I'm not confident enough to try this. So they don't ever get confident enough to try that. So what I try to do is I try to dial it back. Well, okay, why are we even talking about you speaking on stage in front of a thousand people? We got to get you speaking in general first because I was not confident enough to speak on stage either. It started with me talking into a microphone with nobody listening. So I think that's the part, John, is we have to figure out where your comfort zone actually is and we have to avoid you jumping all the way into the anxiety zone. Everybody says nothing grows inside the comfort zone, but nobody really knows where somebody else's learning zone is. It's very, very, very personal. So one of the things that I have learned over the last five years is Alan's learning zone is my anxiety zone. When we're learning stuff in business and Alan's like stretched, I am living in anxiety. I didn't realize that for the first really for the first four years. Now we know that very well. That has taught me a lot. It has definitely increased my resilience, but I have definitely dealt with anxiety because of it. That's good to know. That's important to know. Everybody has a different scale. So just because it's not in somebody else's learning zone to do what you're doing, it doesn't mean that you're off for doing it. I would really make sure that you're not that far outside of your comfort zone because it can be detrimental if you go too far. Do you think it's important for people to live um, just a little bit in the anxious zone? Between- I think it depends. I think it depends on the person. I think it depends on the person because what will happen for many people is they'll hit the anxiety zone and they'll jump back into comfort. And then they'll just do the cycle from comfort to anxiety, comfort to anxiety, comfort to anxiety. And almost nothing happens. Almost nothing happens because you're not building habits. You're not build, building positive reinforcements. So I think it depends on the person. Um, it's hard because if you have mental health challenges, you know, I'd almost, you just barely be in the learning zone. So it depends. I think it's personal. It depends on the person. And it also depends on the arena as well. Every time I fly, I'm living in the anxiety zone. I do not like planes at all, at all. And that takes a lot out of you too. So it depends. I think it's definitely personal. Are there any specific habits? Uh, you said that you you have about uh, a few habits that you follow every single day. Yeah. Do you believe that there's um, uh, good habits versus bad habits? Of course, yeah, 100%. Um, I, I always classify good habits as something that is bringing you closer to your goals. Bad habits is something that is taking you further away from your goals. Um, and it's all, again, it's it's all customized and personal, right? The things that I do, most people won't because- they don't have a podcast. So just as an example, uh, I track the business finances every day. I track podcast listens every day. I either work out or do mobility every single day, uh, 45 minutes of learning, review the podcast, you know, send messages to listeners. That's what I do every day. What I always suggest for people is break it into three buckets, health, wealth, and love. So under health, when you wake up, weigh yourself. Under wealth, when you wake up, I want you to write the amount of money you have in your bank account and then do it again tomorrow and then measure the difference. And then for love, before you go to bed, if you have a partner, tell that partner what you're grateful for about them, about the relationship, about the day. Or if you are single and you don't have a partner, whatever your own version of self-love is, whether that's taking a bath, doing yoga, doing gratitudes for yourself. So I very much subscribe to small habits building up over time small positive habits building up over time. But yeah, I would say that that's a good place to start. And I think people, a good understanding is you don't necessarily, um, you don't necessarily suck or struggle with habits. It's bad or good. Going through the drive-through is a habit. It might not be a positive habit, but you have to understand that you're probably taking the path of least resistance. That's why you're doing it. So yeah, setting up some things in your life that makes it easier to do the habits is super important too. But yeah, hundred percent. I really like how you keep it simple, especially with the habits, because it's such a challenge to, yeah. you know, as a personal yeah. trainer, like it's, it's like trying to bash your head up against a wall. Yeah. You got to keep it simple. I mean, I started, I do 20 things or 21 things a day now. Awesome. And again, 
that's me. I'm, I'm aspiring to this different goal. But I started with three or five. I started with the ones I just said. And I used to miss all the time. I didn't get 100% days. I was missing all the time. And then when I got to the point where, you know, I was getting 100% for a week in a row or two weeks, then I would add another one. And we've really seen, and this is interesting, we saw this in group coaching. One of our groups, I think we started with 12 habits and we were like, oh, that's way too many. Like we, that's what we learned. Like that's way too many. That's so many habits for somebody to start. And then I think we dropped to like nine. We're like still way too many. So now we do three habits. If you, it's either three or six, but every two weeks we check in. If you're over 75%, we add three more. And then we add three more. That way it's sustainable. And if, if you can do that, to John's point, it's got to be simple. You got to keep it simple. It's the small stuff that adds up over time. You're not going to build a mountain or climb a mountain or knock down a mountain overnight. That just takes time. And we're all on our own journey of time. What about the people that are like, because I'm guilty of this. I, I can say I'm guilty of this. I have 30, have, I have 30 things I want to achieve. Mm. How do you, how do you go about telling that person, you know what, just pull the reins a little bit, <laughs> a little bit on, uh, just pull, pull them back just a little bit. You, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It depends on how many of the things are aligned, but you say, look, you can either, and this really is kind of the truth. You can either do one thing world-class or you can do a bunch of things, you know, percentage decent. Really, that's really the only way it works. And if you can get really good at one thing, that's when you get the opportunity to do a bunch of other things. So that's what I always say. I had a call with somebody and she said, I want to, I want to do a podcast and I want to do a blog. And I'm thinking of doing music. And I have like these two other things I want to do. And I said, all right, cool. If you could only pick one, what would it be? And she said, music. But I, don't, I, I want to do all of them. And I said, that's fine. Let's focus on music for now. And when you show me, you can post every single day on social media, a new piece of music, then maybe we can add in other things, but you got to choose the biggest one, the most important one, the most aligned one. And you have to prove that you can be consistent there. I think that's, it has to be that. I mean, when you think about the way a house is built, it's built level by level, right? They do the foundation and then they, they do the framing and they do, it's not all at once because it would be really hard for everybody to do the same thing at the same time. There's too much going on. So yeah, you have to simplify it, but it's, I think the other thing that makes it difficult, John, is some people are more variety driven. So they don't want to podcast every day or they don't want to, you know, write their book every day. So that's another part of it where you have to check in with yourself and say, okay, well, I'm going to focus on this thing, but I'm going to make sure I'm filling my cup with these things. That's a, that's another part of it too. But yeah, you really have to decide. There's only so much time. There's only so much energy. There's only so much willpower that you can put in throughout the day. Like as an example, I think this is my sixth podcast of the day. There's very little else happening for me today. There's, I'm still going to do my habits, but other than that, I'm not doing coaching calls or almost anything else. Like I, I'm choosing quite literally one thing today to just hammer and then tomorrow's a different day. And I think it's, it's like that on the micro and the macro. Yeah, I love it. I love that because uh, I'm going to be starting doing that in July. We are recording this in June. So I'm going to be doing that in July because right now my squirrel brain is taking over. And it's <laughs> like, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And it, uh, one thing that I've noticed, um, and I, I, I want to know if you can attest to this, is that when you start to put too much on your plate, you know, you have these past limiting beliefs pop into your plate, into, onto your plate also and say, you know what, you are not that good at, at this. And that can actually spill off into stuff that you are good. How important do you think it's for a person to acknowledge their limiting beliefs and how does one move past them? I think it is the, maybe the most important thing um, because the level of self-awareness that it takes, I think is, is required for the journey. I really do. Self-awareness is such an important part of the journey. So there's a couple ways to do it. I like to paint it kind of as a picture. 
And I want you to imagine this. When you are born, you are a mere seed. You're just a little seedling. And you're planted in soil that you have no control over. Sometimes that soil is toxic. And this is where you plant your roots. This is where you learn. This is where your limiting beliefs come from. And as you get older, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, you're learning all this stuff from these books, but it doesn't seem to land. It doesn't seem to go to the root. It doesn't seem to go to the seed. The problem is you're focusing on learning a bunch of new stuff when many of us need to unlearn a bunch of new uh, old stuff. You have to unlearn the old stuff to make space for the new stuff. And that's where the limiting beliefs come in, right? So I think there's a couple things. One, especially when your plate is full, you have to look at your most recent and relevant proof. So think of it this way. I'll get off this podcast and one of two things will happen. I'll say, wow, I, I crushed that. I am the best ever. John is blown away. Nobody will ever be as good as I was on that show, right? And I'm not, I don't think I'll, I'll think that to that degree, but, or that is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I, I'm sure John is going to cancel that. He's just going to erase it and pretend we never met. Then I would look at, well, that podcast is way better than most of the ones we did in the beginning. It's definitely better than the one I did today at 11 a.m. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. No, that was actually pretty good. And you have to understand that your level eight might be somebody else's level 10. That's another important thing to, to look at when it comes to learning beliefs is that whole conversation. I also, I often try to get people to ask why. When it comes to self-awareness, I think asking why is the best question of all time because you get down to the root of it. So why do I think I did a bad job? I don't know. I, I, my, my points didn't land. Okay, why? Well, John didn't laugh a lot. Okay, well, why? Well, maybe John's nervous. Well, why? Right? And then you get down to, oh, maybe John was nervous because I have so many episodes and he looks up to that in some way, shape, or form. Awesome. And then you get down to the root. So yeah, why is a great question for self-awareness, 100%. And I think that answers the question. Oh yeah. Okay. It's maybe it's maybe it's because John is so nervous that he can't <laughs> ask the proper questions. No, 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 not true. <laughs> you said why, and I've been I've been infant infatuated with why for the past two years, two almost three years now, and um, I know how important why is, and I really love that you actually are actually pushing why as well. Hmm. How do you help people understand their why? How do you help them come to their roots? Yeah, it's, I try to paint it as a picture of three identities. I think humans, it depends on the journey but and, and the age. But what I do is I say, okay, uh, the identity of you growing up, let's just say like elementary school, middle school, high school, college, right? Like early, tell me about your identity. I was shy. I was this, I was this, I was this, I was this. Okay, cool. Tell me about your identity now. Who are you as a human being now? How do you identify? Well, you know, I'm shy, this, this, this. Okay, cool. In order to feel like you need to feel in the future, what would your identity need to be? And then people will go through that. And oftentimes what you'll see is you'll see that their past identity and their current identity are almost closer, almost always closer than their current identity and the identity they want in the future. And that's one way to start the conversation. And then you check in with, so a couple of thoughts. One, I think, and our mentor, Evan Carmichael says this, your why, your purpose usually comes from your deepest pain. So the reason I want to help people with mental health, I want to help people with self-improvement is because I feel like if I had self-improvement earlier in my life, I never would have got to the point I'm at. That's one part of it. But I think you have to look at your past because most of, most of everything that you're dealing with today came from your past. And oftentimes there are clues in your past of what you should be doing today. Many of us just don't want to look at it because maybe it's surrounded by trauma or scarcity or bad memories or lack or whatever it may be. But I think there's a lot of stuff hidden in there. I really do. I think there's a lot of stuff hidden in there. I don't know if you can have a successful future without visiting and rewriting your past. I really don't know if you can. So that's what I would say. I would say, look, the odds are your why has already happened. 
The reason for your why has probably already happened. Maybe you're burying it. Maybe you have limiting beliefs around the fact that you can't do it, you know, for a job or whatever. And then you can dig into those as well. But yeah, I would say you have to reflect. I think that's why meditation and, and being alone with your thoughts is so important. I made a joke earlier. When you're in the shower, one of the reasons I think you have so many powerful thoughts is because there's nothing else. There's no noise. There's no music. There's no TV. There's no distractions. It's you sitting with your thoughts. And for many people, that's the first time they've done that all day. Also, if you think about it, and I don't know, I don't know if there's science behind this. I'm not a doctor, but when you lie down at night, I know it used to be very, very, very hard for me to sleep if I didn't have any silence throughout the day, because I'd be listening to music all day or whatever. And my mind never had time to actually just be with itself. And when you're laying in bed, there's nothing else. So I wonder if that is correlated as well. Well, I think it is because uh, you actually brought up an interesting point there. Um, it's part of the circadian rhythm between the hours of, I believe it's three, no, 6.30 PM and 10.30 PM. I know this for, I know this because I've studied this. Mm. <laughs> um, you're not supposed to be watching like TV and, and, you know, anything like doing any kind of work, just l allowing your, like you said, allowing your mind to just shut off slowly. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a very important uh, part of our day. Uh, but coming back to the limiting beliefs in your, one of the recent podcast episodes that you did episode 933 you talked about as you can tell i've been doing my homework <laughs> i'm grateful <laughs> i appreciate it you talked about making excuses as your answer hmm. okay can you elaborate a little bit more on that yeah i think that um there's a level of ownership that is required for you to say you know what i messed up and it's my fault and I think that a lot of people that don't have the confidence yet or the self-belief or the self-awareness or the self-esteem, they use excuses. And I'm, I'm guilty of this too, right? I'm guilty of this too. I had a moment earlier, there was a podcast I was supposed to be on and they didn't send over the uh, link to get into the room. And my natural tendency is, well, somebody else messed this up. I'm like, this isn't my fault. It's not, you know, I didn't do this. And then upon further review, it was... Yeah, no, I missed that. That's on me. I, when, I, when I reviewed my calendar for the week, I previewed my calendar. I didn't notice that. That's on me. I could very easily make an excuse and say, well, John, you don't know what it's like to be on seven episodes a day. Like, it's a lot. You know, you've never done that. That's an excuse. Maybe that is true, but it doesn't mean that I shouldn't take ownership for the fact that I'm the one who made the mistake. I think a lot of us, when we're scarce, we find it easy to throw blame on other people. And we make excuses because we don't want to either look bad or we don't want to have to take a look in the mirror or we don't want to have that self-worth hit. Maybe we don't believe we can. I know that that's always been a challenge for me. And one of the reasons I feel more capable of doing it now than I ever have is because it doesn't affect my self-worth when I make mistakes as much. I mean, I'm sure it still does, but I think that you have to understand that if you're making excuses, you're letting yourself down. And when you make excuses, you actually give up the power of making a change. If it's somebody else's fault that you didn't go to the gym, or if it's somebody else's fault that you didn't get the client or whatever, then you don't have an opportunity to improve it and then actually make that result happen. So I think making excuses takes away your power. Now, again, I'm not all knowing philosophical, fully enlightened. I still have my days and I still have my excuses like anybody else. So I don't want to stand on my soapbox when I say that, but, and this is, you know, there's layers again, right? So going back to what we talked about, if you ask yourself, well, why did I make the excuse or why did that happen? Then you can have that self-awareness conversation with yourself. And then you can possibly get a breakthrough out of something that might seem like a big mistake. I love it. I love it. Um, last year I came into, uh, was, yeah, last early last year, 2021, I came into um, the understanding of extreme ownership from Jocko Wilnick. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what you said. Yeah, everything that happens good or bad. It's on me. Mm -hmm. Like if I didn't do if I missed an episode, that's that's on me if, you know, you know, emergency happened, and I had to do something else and which led to something else which I, which I had to miss. It's on me. Yeah, you know, so I, I love it. Um, 
I'm sure you've had a very interesting journey up journey, a uh, podcasting journey up to 1000 episodes. And I'm sure that you've had a lot of, uh, we talked a little bit about the, um, some of the self-limiting beliefs that you may have had. Mm. What other self-limiting beliefs have you had to deal with in the past? And what self-limiting beliefs do you deal with currently? Oh man, <clears throat> a lot of the ones I dealt with in the past, I still deal with. Yeah, and I like the frame. It's not which ones did you overcome? Because I think that we deal with a lot of them. Um, one was, I don't understand business well enough. I'm not smart enough. That's another one. Um, what else? I'm not a good enough speaker. That's always, that's always been it. And I don't know that that'll ever go away. I, so here's a, here's a story to connect it. Alan and I were in California and we were at a Brenda Burchard event. And when we went out there, we brought all of our equipment and we did like six interviews in six days or something. Cause we have people out there that are mentors or we interviewed and they said, yeah, you can come interview me in person. We interviewed somebody at their house in, in Malibu, which is awesome. But we ended up interviewing somebody at their mansion in California. And we did the interview in his movie theater, which was wild. That was cool. Then we went downstairs in the backyard. And what he does is when people come over, he has this like roll out a uh, hibachi grill and he cooks for you outside by his pool at this mansion. And he cooked us hibachi and it was awesome. But after that, him and Alan started talking about business. And here I am at this multi-million dollar house, beautiful California, um, supposed to be living the dream. And I'm having all of this internal dialogue of, oh, you don't belong here. You're not good enough. They're talking about business. I don't know what a leveraged buyout is. I don't know any of this stuff. I don't know what we're talking about here. And I had that conversation with myself. That was one of my limiting beliefs was, I do not know and I cannot know business. And I still have those. There, there are podcasts I go on where it's more business focused, where before I go on, I think to myself, this person's going to know I'm a fraud. They're going to ask me something I don't know. You know, imposter syndrome. I still deal with imposter syndrome, just like everybody else. That's, that's a big one. Um, not being smart enough is a, definitely a big one, even though I've studied every day. It's, I don't know if that'll ever go away. And then I still, and I guess this is, this, maybe this is more conditioning than limiting beliefs, but I still have the desire to seek approval from men. I think that part of my, you know, growing up, I grew up without a dad. I think that's part of it. Like when I get around men that have egos, I act a little bit different. You don't have any ego, John. So this is very easy for me in terms of like just having a conversation. I had another wonderful interview with somebody today, another man who had no ego. But when I get on the microphone and there is, there's a man with ego on the other side, I get like, I don't know how to explain it. it I get super uncomfortable. I don't want to be there. I, I just, I don't want to have to like meet their ego, but I don't want to break rapport. It's this like weird thing. And I still, I still deal with that after all these years. Maybe that's not a limiting belief. Maybe that's more a conditioning, but I think I have a limiting belief around the fact that I, I can't change that or adjust that. Well, I'm honored that you think that I don't have an ego. For sure. hundred <laughs> percent. I'm very honored because uh, I used to have a huge ego, mm. but after martial arts, well, that'll do it. Oh yeah. They, yeah. they beat the ego. <laughs> right quite literally, <laughs> quite literally. Yes. It'll, it'll do that. Yeah. yeah I love martial arts for it. Um, I love this part of the, of the podcast because you, you, you put something on the, on the questionnaire about uh, personal failures. And I mm. think this is um, probably one of the best part that we could be talking about right now. How important is failing? Oh man, it's the most important. It's the most important because I think of it and I have a really good story for this, but I think of it as it's like a video game. If you play level one, you most likely aren't going to win. You're most likely going to lose and something's going to happen. Maybe you get to the final boss and you don't know how to beat that final boss and you quote unquote fail. But what happens is the next time you try, you know, yeah, this, this thing falls down at this point. Okay, cool. I go around here. Don't worry about that. And this is how you beat the final boss. The, your failures today, and I know this should be in a fortune cookie and it sounds very, you know, it sounds very philosophical, but 
your failures today become your your successes tomorrow because you know not what you like what doesn't work. You know what not to do. You know what to do. You know where to double down. You know where to avoid. So we did an event uh, Saturday, uh, Sunday, Father's Day. So Alan and I both grew up without fathers. His father passed away when he was younger. Mine was out of the picture. And we have a charity called the Next Level Hope Foundation where we uh, are going to host events for children who are raised by single parents. And we rented out the YMCA and we ordered a bunch of food and we had a bunch of volunteers and we had a, a camera crew and we're like, this is going to be awesome. We want at least 20 kids. This is going to be great. Two kids showed up. Now, it's still two kids that we get the opportunity to impact, and that's what it's all about. But many people would consider that a giant failure. Like you guys said publicly, you're going to get 20 kids, and only two came. But we learned so much. We learned so much about the YMCA and how, how the next event will go down. And we learned so much about how easy it is to keep kids entertained when you have fun games around and how much fun it was for us and what a good bonding experience it was for the team. It might seem like a failure, but more often than not, if you feel like something is a failure, you're not looking at the wins. There is a win in everything. There's a win in everything. One of the biggest failures I've ever had, John, when I was right before I got the job making all that money, I was going through the fire academy. I wanted to be a, a firefighter. So you have to go through the on-call firefighter academy so you can be on call and then maybe get promoted to a job eventually. And I went through this three month or five month, I don't remember how long it was, but I never asked questions. I was so afraid to ask questions and look like an idiot I never asked questions. Even when I had them and they would say, any questions, I would never raise my hand. And we ended up getting to the end. I passed the written test and I, I did really well there because I could study, but there's a practical exam where you have to, there's a bunch of different things. You have to throw a ladder. You have to tie a nozzle a certain way. You have to run the hydrant. There's a bunch of different things. And I never asked any questions when we did the, the physical days, when we did the practical days, I failed. I failed my first training, my first practical exam. Cool, awesome. Fast forward, I study, cool, pass the other ones. The first time I'm on call, for those of you who don't know, when you're on call, you get a pager and that pager is on your person 24 seven. No matter what time that thing goes off, you go down to the fire station. So I'm sleeping in bed one night and the pager goes off and I'm like, oh my goodness, Oh, wow. What are we doing here? All right, cool. Zip down to the fire station, throw on the gear, hop in the truck. And we get to this house and there's a car on fire in the person's driveway. And it's probably two in the morning. I get off the truck and I have no clue what to do. I don't know where to attach this hose. I don't know where to attach this hose. I'm just standing there like a deer in the headlights. All of the times where we were around the trucks and the engines and the tankers in the fire academy, I never asked questions. And it came back to bite me in the butt. It came back to bite me in the butt. If there was something really serious happening at that point, who knows what would happen? I was not helping. I was making things worse. And luckily there was nobody in the car and luckily it was far enough away from the house. My lack of asking questions throughout the fire academy created a giant failure for me, a giant failure for me. But what it also created was the fact that now every time I have the opportunity to ask a question, I do because I know you're either going to get feedback along the way or you're going to get it all at once at the end. And when it comes to it, something like that, you do not want all the feedback at once. You want it along the way. That's probably the biggest failure I've ever had. But number one, I will never forget that. Number two, I was able to take a lot of lessons out of it. And number three, it has adjusted the way I live life now. So yeah, that big failure has definitely created more successes for me moving forward than I expected. Awesome. Other than not asking questions along the way, what other lessons did you learn from it? From the fire Academy in general? Yeah. Oh man. Um, I learned how a couple of things. One, I learned how resilient I was because it was a lot. I mean, there was like some pretty decent physical training in there, which I enjoyed. Um, but I also learned how different things are when you're operating under real pressure. You know, like, yeah, there are some times where you feel real pressure in life, 
But when you're standing next to a fire, that's like a different level of pressure. That that's a whole different thing. And I really enjoyed that. Um, another thing I learned is many people think that you need ego to teach. So there were, there were a couple really, really good instructors that were just amazing. They were patient. They were just really good leaders. There were also some who basically treated it like they were drill sergeants and they were screaming at you. And he just, it was, it was a lot at the end, after you graduated, they showed you nothing but love. So I think part of it was like, Hey, I'm going to be hard on you here, but it's interesting. I learned that different leadership styles affect people in different ways. And I think that helped me realize I do not want to be a loud leader by any stretch of the imagination. That's not, I want to lead by example and through vulnerability, safety, and connection more than, more than anything else. I learned that there for sure. That's awesome. Those are really, really valuable lessons to learn, especially mm -hmm. anywhere. Yeah. Um, one other thing that actually I, I know personally that leads to failing, quote unquote failing, is the concept of overperfection. Mm -hmm. The concept of uh, everything has to be perfect before a launch, before I, you know, launch the product. Um, I'm guilty of this. <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Like, Currently, I'm guilty of that. Do you think that something like that uh, pushes self-sabotage to somebody not being able to put out a product or, or something, something out in the world that would be beneficial for someone? Yeah, I think perfectionism is a couple of things. I think one, it's fear. It's fear dressed up as something else. That's one. I think the second one is it's you assuming it's going to fail. So if you hang on to it for as long as possible, maybe you won't ever have to release it. I really, I think it's those two things. It definitely holds people back. And even to what we just talked about, imagine this. Um, imagine if you went to the airport one day and you're about to get on a plane to go across the country or across the ocean. And somebody said, Hey, uh, what plane is this? And they said, oh, this is the, this is the new plane. Uh, we've been working on this thing for 36 years. And this is the first flight. And we're really excited. We feel like it's going to go pretty well. Uh, we weren't even going to release it today. We were going to wait. But I think today is the day. I would get off that thing so fast and say, nope, not taking this plane. Because it's not proven. It's not proven. You, it's very hard to fix something that's not out in the world yet. The first draft of something is almost always garbage. It just is. And I think that you have to be okay with that. And the other part too is for most people, nobody's going to buy your first thing anyway. Nobody's going to really, and I don't mean this in a negative way. I, this is empowering. Most people aren't going to listen to your first song. I don't know what Taylor Swift's first song was. I have no idea. I don't know if anybody does, right? I have no clue. So I think you have to get the bugs out in the beginning and then you can get better as you go. And then this is the other cool thing. If you do something long enough and get really good at it, it's kind of funny looking back. You know, I make jokes all the time about our first episode. It's not good. I'll never take it down because I think it's important perspective for people. But that's one thing we never had was perfection. There's, we can't, I mean, we don't, we don't edit our show in terms of like, if I say, um, like, but if we laugh, we don't edit it out. Cause I want that in there. I think it's important to make me better. If you're waiting on something to be perfect before you release it, number one, you most likely will never release it. But number two, you're not getting better because you're not getting feedback. So you're really shooting yourself in the foot from both ways. What would you tell someone who wants to try something but's afraid to start because it might fail? Um, number one, believe it or not, not starting is usually the easiest. I know it doesn't seem like it, but it's staying power is a skill that most people don't have. Um, it's hard because I don't want to say the sooner you start, the sooner you'll fail, but the sooner you start, the sooner you'll get valuable lessons to make sure when you restart, it goes in a good way. That's what I would say. You're, you're psyching yourself up more than you need to. You're psyching yourself. People say that all the time. Well, I was going to start a podcast for three years and I never did. I understand. Uh, trust me. I, but it's not as hard as you think. All you need is a microphone to plug into your laptop and there you, you're off to the races. Like there's a couple other things, but it's not hard. 
it's not hard to start a podcast. It's hard to continue a podcast. Yep. Anybody can sign up for a gym membership, personal trainer, but not everybody can show up consistently. So I think you're doing yourself a disservice by waiting. And I think you're actually hurting your self-esteem and your self-confidence because you're proving to yourself that you don't believe you're capable. When in reality, you might get positive feedback. Action is required to build confidence. You have to take action if you want to build confidence. Yeah, it's 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 funny. You a flashback came into my mind about my first uh, first ten episodes. Uh, I would have my camera here, mm. and the monitor would be over here. So every time the guest would be speaking, I'd be like this <laughs> the whole time. So it's like 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 you said, like looking back, I'm like I'm looking at, looking at these things, these episodes, and I'm like laughing. I'm like, yeah. all right, up they go on YouTube. Let's 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 have a laugh. Yeah, it and shows progress. Yeah. And it shows, um, growth too, like, mm -hmm. like progress. Like you said, uh, we're coming close to the end of the show. And these are the seven or eight questions I ask all my guests. And I just like to get your perspective on these seven or eight topics. Okay. Uh, with it, people increase with the increase in people suffering from depression, from the constant uncertainty that we've lived past in the past two years, what would be the one thing that you could tell them to keep their hopes up? Oh man. That's a, that's a tough one. And I think transparently the reason it's tough is because it didn't affect me a ton. Right. I mean, we work from home. I don't leave the house anyway. Our business actually grew through COVID, which I'm very grateful for, but we're pu purely digital. I would say if you were, lucky enough to survive, understand that you survived one of the most impactful things ever in history. And that means you're also capable of thriving in the future. And I think the other part of it too, John, is if you're still struggling, that's okay. I think that, you know, part of, part of the business owner thing is people say like, if you didn't get better during COVID, you're the worst because you had more than enough time. It's like, no, some people were fighting for their lives. Like that's not, that's a blanket statement. So whether you got better or not, I think that's okay. Number one. And number two, whether you got better or not, it doesn't mean you can't get a little bit better moving forward. And if you survived something that traumatic, I think you should give yourself a pat on the back and the future is probably brighter than you believe or realize. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's powerful. Thank you. Of course. It's a tough one. Tough question. I yeah. like it. <laughs> What's the one thing that you do daily that amplifies your ability to stay focused? I would say I look at my habits every single day. I have a spreadsheet that has all of them. Alan created it. I cannot take credit for any of it. I didn't even know how to use Excel before this. Yeah. So first thing in the morning, I wake up. I look at my calendar and that's the last thing I do before I go to bed. I look at the next day's calendar. And then I, when I sit down here in the office, I say, okay, cool. What are the 20 things that I know I should be doing today? And that stays up all day. That would be the one for sure. Cool. Uh, if you could pick up the phone right now and call yourself at 20 years old, <laughs> what would you tell yourself? Oh man. Um, I would say, Hey, Kev, I'm going to give you these six habits. And if you can just do these six habits for the rest of your life, you will be a millionaire by the time you're 30. That's, yeah, that's what I would say. Because at that point, I mean, 10 years, that's a long, yeah, that's what I would say. And I would say, just trust me, trust me. I know you don't know who I am, but trust me. <laughs> uh, looking back, would you change anything? Looking back, would I change anything? Very philosophical, John. I don't think so. Um, because everything that happened created the man that you see in front of you today. All the pains, all the, all the traumas, all the regrets, they created the opportunity for me not to make the same mistake. So no, I don't think so. Cool. I love that answer. <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one. Um, what scares you? Oh man, everything, public speaking, planes, failure. I have a weird tendency where I laugh in very serious conversations and it scares me that people are going to think I'm like laughing at them when it's just like a coping mechanism for me. 
I know that's a weird one. I'm afraid of like everything, really. I definitely have social anxiety to a, a degree. Yeah, I'm afraid of, if you're listening, there's a chance that I'm probably afraid of everything you're afraid of and maybe more. And I always want that to, I want to be humanized. I'm not, I'm not a cyborg or anything like that. I'm, I'm a human with a human experience. I have limiting beliefs and fears just like everybody else. Love it. Love it. Um, where do you see next level university in the next five years? The next five years. Um, let's see five years. Hopefully I, we intend on the next five years, we will have 10 million downloads. Uh, we'll be making $10 million a year. The next level hope foundation, our foundation is going to double every year. So that'll probably be around like four or $5 million we're able to work with for charity. So yeah, just the same thing we're doing now, just multiplied by 25. That's the goal. Very cool. How about you personally? Um, five years from now, I'll be 37. I will say I will be living in a very beautiful home with a very beautiful family, uh, driving my Mercedes AMG GTR that I dream about every single day in the best body I've ever had in terms of health in the most love I've ever been and the most financially free ever. And I, I got to say impact and impacting more people than ever. Yeah. Great. Uh, where can people find more about you? If you like what John and I talked about, uh, we have a podcast called next level university where we talk about stuff like this all the time. And this was truly wonderful. Uh, seven episodes a week, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find us. And we're also on YouTube. And then if you want to talk to me directly, you can ping me on Instagram at never quit kid. That is my handle. Awesome. And uh, we'll post all the links that you gave us. So everybody has easy access to you, Next Level University, and all of you guys, all of your content as well. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Any final thoughts? Uh, let me think. Okay, last, last quote. I'll give you one more quote. Um, your reality becomes the parts of your imagination that you hold on to and pour into the longest. Back when I was podcasting by myself, I had no idea what I was doing. Episode number seven, I said, my goal is to wake up when I want, go to sleep when I want, go to the gym when I want, podcast with amazing people, spend time with my loved ones and be my own boss. And that is something that I poured into and just kept after for the next five years. And that is what I am grateful enough to do now. Now, I, I will not stand here or sit here and say anything is possible for anyone. We all have certain abilities and we all have certain circumstances, but I do believe if you hang on to your imagination, you can get to wild places that maybe you didn't even believe were possible. Kevin, thank you so much. You're very welcome, John. It was my pleasure. Um, I've been, like I said, I've been going, I've been doing my homework on you and I next level tell. university. And all I have to say is I'm blown away. I'm mm -hmm. actually blown away. Thank you so much for one coming on my show. So I, I can have this, this conversation with you and two for all the hard work that you put in. I know how hard it is to, stay consistent and stay committed to a podcast. It is not as easy as most people think it is. Yeah. And um, for you to be my guiding star to where I want to be in three years is uh, it means a lot to me. So thank you so much for showing me the way. <laughs> You're very welcome. I appreciate it. And like I said, this has been a pleasure on my end as well. This is wonderful. I, I'll do this every day. You want to squeeze me in every day for the rest of the time. I'll, I'll add this to the, uh, to the seven podcasts a week. I appreciate it very much, John, more than you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, going through hard times is just a test. What you need to know is that when you get out of whatever you're going through, you will be stronger than ever before, and you don't need to go through it alone. Always know that you are not alone. Stay tuned for more real people with amazing stories that are just like yours. Until then, to everyone out there listening, I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or good night, wherever you may be in this crazy world. Hey, everybody, it's John from Resilient Reboot Productions and the Fitness Oracle. Thank you for watching this episode, and I really hope that you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell, and share 
this video if you are watching this on YouTube or on Rumble. If you're listening to this on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast Breaker, or whatever streaming service that you may be using, please give us a five-star rating and a positive res review as, as it will help us reach more people that are suffering from mental health issues. Before you go, I'd like to invite you to join us on Pod Inbox. This is a great platform that we can keep the conversation going. Over the years, we've discovered that the best way to help people regain their confidence back of whatever fitness goal that they are looking for is to put together a tight-knit community that will be here to support you in that journey. So in order for us to do that, we are partnering up with Pod Inbox to help us create that platform and give you that opportunity to uh, have your voice. So all you have to do is click on the link below in the show notes and get your set up your free account on Pod Inbox right now. And let's hear your voice. So I can't wait to start talking to you guys there. It's going to be a, it's a great platform for all of us to get together and discuss the issues that are, that we're suffering from until then I'll see you guys soon.